So, thank you everyone for joining us at sharing of some new songs from the musical Man and God. I'm Leo Dalton, I wrote the words for it. You will see on your screen that there is Professor Michael Berkowitz, uh, who did the research on which the entire musical is based and has done most of the work to actually ensure it happens, and Jake Dorfman, uh, the composer, who wrote all the music and did all the orchestrations as well. This is an event which is being done in part collaboration with UCL's Knowledge Exchange and the Lithuanian Embassy, and we are privileged to have the cultural attaché, Justi uh, Kosti Kovaite, uh, and uh, we have been having a wonderful time working out how to share knowledge about this event. If anyone is from the Knowledge Exchange from UCL, do feel free to give us a wave. Uh, equally, if you're not here, that's also fine. So, for unfortunately, we've had a slight technical hitch. So, the way we're going to be sharing the music throughout this event is that when we have one of the songs ready to share with you and we get to that point, we will pop a link into the chat. Uh, which will take you to YouTube and then we'll give a few minutes while everyone has a listen and then pop back to here. Uh, just because that means you get a high quality version of it rather than the slightly juddery video sharing that you would get on Zoom normally. Towards the end of this uh, session of talks and sharings of bits of the musical, there'll be a Q&A session. So at any point, if you have a question you think you want us to answer later on, do feel free to pop it in the chat. Uh, whether that's something about the research and Michael's work, or if it's something about the musical and artistic process, or just something entirely unexpected, though, you know, obviously questions about our breakfast and our pets are fine. Uh, questions which require us to throw you out of the Zoom meeting are not. Uh, so please use the chat wisely. But for now, uh, I believe that the best thing to start with is to start off with a number from the musical, which I am popping in the chat now. If you have any questions, please do feel free to contact me through the chat. I'll look forward to seeing you in about three minutes. Cause here is my friend's life, preserved in black and white, with no romance or strife, with no color or light. You can't imagine this man might ever have fun. What if what happened to us happened to everyone? It's black and white simple, no swollen red pimple to pop and no blue tune. No green, no York. How did this colorless chump ever do what we've done? What if what happened to us happened to everyone? There are people who want me to forget the whole picture. But those people won't make me see now yet, so I'll teach ya. I'm frightened that one day a rotten and cruel An enlightened old censor will write And remove us from history Not just Manus and me What if one day someone tries to erase Everything humanity's done What if what happened to us Happened to everyone. Debbie, can you help me? So, hopefully, that's been enough time for everyone to listen. Uh, can I just check whether Beth and Deb, you managed to? eventually get through. Wonderful. Thank you. So in that case, I'm going to hand over to 
Uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Michael, if, if that's okay. Okay, so Michael, you need to unmute yourself. Lovely. I am. And fantastic. In that case, Michael, you are now the host. <laughs> and take it away. Okay, well, um, as everyone is already used to these kinds of um, these kinds of glitches in our new virtual world. Um, in any case, I want to welcome everyone to this evening's presentation of selections from the musical in progress, Man and God, which has been made possible by a grant from University College London's Knowledge Exchange Program. The musical explores the history of the creation and afterlives of the Kodachrome film process conceived in the early decades of the 20th century. Okay, um, I'm going to try and run the PowerPoint. Hopefully that, will, um, hopefully that will work. So from now on, you might see me off to the side, but hopefully you'll see, um, you'll see the PowerPoint screen. Okay, can you see it? Good. Yes, okay. Um, the academic home of this project is the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies of University College London, known as UCL. And our major partners are Virtually Opera and the Lithuanian Embassy in London. Oops. Tonight's event is dedicated to the honor and memory of my colleague, friend, and former head of department, Professor Ada Rappaport Albert. Ada, in addition to being a foremost historian of Jewish women's history and mysticism, sang and acted at a professional level and was a keen supporter of bridging the worlds of scholarship and the public. Oops. In bringing this phase of the project to fruition, and on behalf of the writer-director, Leo Dalton, and composer and orchestrator, Jacob Dorfman, we wish to express our warmest thanks to Joe Townsend, Maria Trejo, Ba Arts, Rachel Harris, Casey Johnson, Vanessa Richard, and Yuste Kostakovaita. Given the unusual circumstances, which I need not explain, I have not had the pleasure to meet the musicians and performers in person. Heartfelt thanks go to Oscar Conlon Mori in the role of Leo Godowski Jr. and Nicholas McLean playing Kenneth Meese. The music director and pianist is the Royal Shakespeare Company's Jack Hopkins with Samantha Normans on violin, Samantha Norman on violin, Peter Wilson cello, Isa Osman bass, Mikey Davis, tenor sax, Adrian Taylor, trombone, and Matthew Furcus, drums. Leo Dalton is the director and writer, and our composer and orchestrator is Jake Dorfman. Man and God derives from my ongoing research about Kodachrome, conducted mainly at the George Eastman Museum and University of Rochester Archives, and work more broadly on the Jewish engagement with photography. What was marketed as Kodachrome, devised by Leopold Manis and Leopold Godowski Jr., known as Man and God, stupendously advanced the quality and accessibility of full color photographic prints, slides, and motion pictures beginning in the 1930s. It was built on experiments that Leopold Manis and Leopold Godowski Jr. dreamed up as teenagers while skipping out of school sports and music practice. Kodachrome, including its acknowledged and uncredited offshoot brands, was a colossal worldwide hit from the late 1930s to the 1980s. Kodak's orange and red sign, which hasn't quite totally vanished, used to be ubiquitous, and the Kodachrome process was fundamental to the company's success while it lasted, that is before the digital revolution. 
the inventors of Kodachrome, Manus and Godowski, born around 1900, were themselves the children of renowned classical musicians. Their families were not, however, wealthy, as one might equate with celebrity. Among their crucial social connections were the Damroches, tied to the Manus clan, who helped found the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. Leopold Manus's parents, David and Clara, established the Manus School of Music in Manhattan. The Manus School is now part of the New School University. Leopold Manus also was a behind the scenes patron of music education for African Americans. And he secured, he secured refuge for several musicians fleeing Hitler's Europe. Leopold Godowski Jr. was the son of Leopold Godowski, a dazzling pianist who's mainly recalled for his transcriptions of Liszt, Schubert, and especially Chopin. Godowski Sr. was born in Zosli, a tiny shtetl between Kovno and Vilna, then in the Russian Empire, not far from where my own Litvak family originates. It's actually still in the Kaunas, it's in the Kaunas region of Lithuania. Among other distinctions, Leopold Godowski Sr. served as professor of piano and composition in the court of the Austrian emperor, Franz Josef. Well, Leo Jr. was not only born into a deeply musical family, he married into one too. His wife was Frances, known as Frankie, the kid sister of George and Ira Gershwin. Leo and Leopold were lifelong pals, as we say in America, of George and Ira. Perhaps my most significant historical discovery in the context of the Kodachrome story is that, Leopold, is that Leo Jr. and Leopold Manis played a key role in launching the career of George Gershwin in 1924 at New York's Aeolian Hall. My own interpretation of Kodachrome's history stresses the relationship between the approach to music of Leopold Godowski Sr. and his son and, and Manis with regard to their scientific practice. I'll say more about this near the close of my remarks. The show's core dramatic tension and smattering of humor reveals that Kodachrome grew from the efforts of two boys who were well-educated but had no formal scientific training beyond their bachelor's degrees. Besides their trials and tribulations on the road to moderate Wall Street backing and employment at Eastman Kodak in Rochester, and their monumental successes, they suffered serious distress and setbacks. This was due uh, in part to issues of depression and dementia, the later being the tragic case of Leopold Godowski Sr. The story overall unfolds on the heels of the Great War, that is, the First World War as first and, generation, first and second generation American Jews, Leo and Leopold fervently believed that they could merge high and popular culture, classical and jazz music, science and industry, popular photography and the movies, and contribute to the liberal, democratic, humane values that they held dear, while, as we say, uh, making a nice living. What Manus and Godowski, known as Man and God at Eastman Kodak, did not foresee, however, is that they would be largely written out of the history of color film and motion pictures. Well, I'm going to begin by talking about the third number first. Um, it's called I Do What I Can. You'll be hearing this at the end of our program. And that has a distinct UCL dimension which in some ways is the backbone to the entire story. Manis and Godowski were hired at the behest of Kenneth, Kenneth Meese, the first head of Kodak's research laboratory. Meese, not Jewish, but not Anglican either, coming from one of the dissenting denominations, had been a student and instructor at University College London, UCL. He did all of his degrees at UCL. 
while employed as an industrial scientist. He was grabbed by Kodak's founder, George Eastman. Actually, George Eastman bought the entire uh, Ratten and Wainwright company in order to get Mies as his first head of research. Ratten and Wainwright was a photographic plate company. Mies was one of the sharpest minds in photographic science, and he himself was open-minded, seeking to hire the most talented people and allowing them to exercise their creativity. It's highly unlikely that we would have Kodachrome if not for Mies, and much of its later development was due to the refugee scientists he recruited. If it was not reputed to be expressly anti-Semitic as a company, and it certainly was deeply racist in its various company practices for most of its existence, Eastman Kodak was long suspected of having informal quotas on employing Jews in being a less than friendly workplace. Its research laboratory, however, was believed to be the exception. My own father, who worked in Kodak's metal department, would be almost wistful when he would talk about research as a place that was sort of a haven. The song, I Do What I Can, which you'll hear at the end performed by Nicholas McLean, explores Mies, Mises' thoughts and dilemmas as he found himself responsible for the fate of scientists seeking refuge from Nazi Germany. Mies saved probably around two dozen, with at least half of them Catholic and Protestant, but categorized as Jews under National Socialist racial policy. And by the way, those familiar with earlier versions of the musical, in our selections here, the character of Adolf Hitler will not be appearing. The first number, obituary, is based on a discussion from the early 1960s between Leopold Godowski Jr. and Robert Moses. Robert Moses is both renowned and reviled as the master builder, some would say destroyer, of the city of New York in New York State. At that moment, he was the head of the New York World's Fair, 1963, 1964, and I was there, as you can see. Um, Godowski tried to convince Moses, as he called him, that the World's Fair was an ideal forum for a project that he called Living Archives, an attempt to capture as much of human culture and history as possible with the highest quality film and sound technology, sort of a super YouTube. In the song, he refers to the recent death of Leopold Manus, who left very little historical record of his own life. It's also important to recall that this was the height of the Cold War when humankind trembled in fear of a nuclear exchange. I found a profoundly moving letter from Leopold Godowski to his brother-in-law, Ira Gershwin, in which he ponders, what if what happened to the United States, Europe, even the Soviet Union, akin to what happened to the Jews of Europe, that is the Holocaust, some 95% of the Jews of Lithuania, the old country of the Godowskis and the Gershwins, were murdered by the Nazis and their accomplices. What if what happened to us happened to everyone? The second number, Our Living Archive, somewhat resembles, uh, revisits the first song, a duet between Leo Godowski Jr. and Mies. Godowski knew that his idea for a living archive which would try to capture the arts and culture of all humanity, regardless of religion, class, and perceptions of race, was something that would hurt, stir the heart and soul of Mies. There's another Rochester and rather personal story in the Mies connection. It's no coincidence that the favored portrait of both Mies and George Eastman was by Nachum Elia Lubishez, whose official title was demonstrator for the Eastman Kodak Company in Harrow. In my last book, I argued that Lubishez was an avant-garde and social realist photographer, in addition to being, being an excellent portraitist, as well as an unsung pioneer in the field of ronchonology, later radiography, 
and radiology technologies. Lubisha said that he had come to Europe to study painting, but most likely he got into a little spot of trouble as an anarchist in his native Kansas City. And of course, ultimate proof of him being a bad boy or slippery character is that his mother, it's a little bit hard to see in the document that I show here, but his mother was one Fanny Berkowitz, who probably um, is one of my relatives. Well, surely the finest portrait we have of Mies was done by Lubishez. Oops, just go back and uh, 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 this is back to Rochester. And here you see some of uh, um, the Rochester Berkowitzes and a pal that is the oboist Mitch Miller. There's a small picture on the bottom of my father and my late aunt. Um, Gertrude was actually a, a school buddy of, um, of Mitch Miller's and my late, my late sister. Up above you see a map locating Rochester and a picture postcard from, um, from Kodak Park. Well, in this show, we're introduced to two of the male lead characters, but it's also important to talk about some of the other figures, that is, some of the women who helped to create Kodachrome as well. Possibly that will be the subject of our next outing. Manis and Godowski as boys hatched their wild idea of inventing color movies because they thought that they had a toehold in Hollywood from Leo Godowski's older sister, Dagmar. She was a siren of the silent screen. Because of Dagmar, they were indeed allowed to experiment with a sophisticated movie projection system at the Roxy. And this stage of trial and error was critical on the way to Kodachrome. They also benefited immeasurably from Manis's sister, Maria. Maria, a brilliant journalist and social activist, introduced the boys to her friend Robert Wood, a physicist from the University of Wisconsin and Johns Hopkins, who was keen to liven up show business with science. Wood helped direct them to Mies and Kodak. Well, along with the research per se, a lot of the insight that informs this work comes from my students, and I would be absolutely nowhere without them. David Conway is the person who really helped me to understand what made Leopold Godowski Sr. so controversial. And to put it as briefly as possible, he said that in transcribing music, there are different ways to do it. You can either stick very closely to the text, sort of to try to follow it as it is, or you can play with it more you can have more liberty and make it more complex. And he explained to me that Godowski Sr. Was, was controversial because he made everything as complicated as possible. And in my research, I found out that part of the reason why Kodachrome worked is because Manis, Manis and Godowski Jr. embraced complexity and they weren't, uh, uh, they weren't keen to simplify as is often the case of scientific practice. So this was, absolutely crucial. Uh, uh, down below, Jacob Schiff and the Art of Risk. Uh, this is from my PhD student, Adam Gower, and he wrote about Jacob Schiff and the early financing of Japan around the turn of the century. And from him, I gained an appreciation that one doesn't only have to have ideas, but you need actually financial backing for them if they are going to get anywhere. And the fact that um, there was interest on the part of Felix Warburg who steal these boys, steered the boys to Kuhn and Loeb was actually really important. Another work that's really important, here you see Elsie's War. This is one of the early books actually for young, young readers of my PhD student, Frank Davis Smith. Frank Davis Smith wrote his PhD about the Leica company uh, during the Second World War. Actually, uh, Ernst, Leitz, uh, uh, um, Ernst Leitz II saved some 70 Jews and was um, very, very helpful. At the same time, he was a proper member of the Nazi party and his company did all sorts of things in the, in the Nazi interest. So I, I'd say that the work of, I'm now Dr. Frank Davis Smith, who also happens to be a rabbi, sort of enlightened me about the complexity of um, uh, corporations having to, or at times trying to maintain their integrity in the various pressures that they face. There's a student who didn't finish a PhD, um, Lita Barna, Lita Barner, who wrote about um, patents. And through the kind of work that she did, I was informed of how incredibly important the history of patent and patent protection was to 
Manus and Godowski. And in some ways, this is part of the key to the story as well. That is, when I saw a file of um, actually lawsuits um, in the George Eastman House archives, I learned that um, Kodachrome really was the process upon which almost all of these other color processes um, had been based. So um, just to say um, a couple of last, um, a couple of last points. Um, you have a little image here of Paul, um, um, Paul Simon's album in which he has the song Kodachrome. We're not gonna play it for you here, but he had it just about right. That is, there, wa there was, there will never be anything like Kodachrome. I think for anyone who has never seen real Kodachrome slides projected on a screen, or seen well done prints, you're really missing something. In some ways it's kind of like people have no idea what real records sound like. Well, Leo Dalton, our writer, director, and our music director, composer, Jake Dorfman have graciously agreed to field some questions in the post in, in our discussion portion. So without further ado, back on with the show. So what we're going to listen to now is one of the songs Michael mentioned, and thank you, Michael, for a talk that every time I listen to it, it's really interesting hearing how your research has developed since the last time I heard it, uh, mm -hmm. which is very fun. So uh, this song is about a, the ongoing conversation between uh, Leopold Kodowski Jr.'s interest in the Living Archive and Kenneth Meese's role in shaping thoughts around uh, what exactly do you want to record if you are trying to record all of human history in one place? And the link should be popping into your chat round about now. My living archive of all that I have seen, my demonstration of the history that's been forgotten, neglected, omitted by design. By people who say that not a single line is mine A living archive for preserving history Will classify and keep the tale of all society Recorded, remembered, the rich and the poor Those long forgotten people who ensured we'd win the war In our My sister was a gem My man, as I ask you Who remember them? They're more than just examples Of friends in history These individual people Can't be written up like me History's the tale of mighty actors Upon the global stage You matter if you're a man with power The rest are worth a page Tell a story Change the world in ways the great try to ignore. There'll be more in our archive. Our living archive. Our living archive of all that we have seen. Our demonstration of the history that's been. Recorded, remembered, uniting to ensure. And I'm hoping that by now everyone's listened to it, judging from the increasing number of people pulling away from their screens with expressions, generally speaking, in the more optimistic end of responses, which is very encouraging for us to see. Uh, so uh, thank you for the nice comments in chat. That's always somewhat heartening to see at this point of the process. This is a bit where Jake and I would like to just share a bit about the process of essentially translating a piece of academic research into a, a piece of 
musical theatre because obviously you know there are some books uh, Michael would often talk about uh, Hamilton in this context and uh, Dom Cherno's research that ended up being part of the uh, stimulus for Hamilton for Lin-Manuel Miranda's work uh, but in this case because we are working directly with the academic in question it's been quite intriguing and Jake I suppose probably the best place to go is to start with you and just to remind everyone if you want to have questions in the Q&A do feel free to pop them in the chat as we go along uh, we'll come back to them later. Jake. Okay. Fantastic so I'm Jake Dorfman I wrote the tunes for this show the what I'd really like to talk about is the difference and the development between our initial production and what we have here um, you can you heard a song from the previous production earlier and you've just heard a new one and I think it's quite self-evident that they've developed stylistically. So the most interesting question for me, or one of the most interesting questions as a composer is what sort of sound world is this show going to inhabit? The real choice being, is it going to be, for want of a better word, an authentic sound world? Are we going to be using music of the mid 20th, uh, of mid 20th century New York? Or are we going to use music which is not of that time period, but which nonetheless expresses something about those characters? And I think from the initial production to today, we've really gone from the former to the latter. I think that would be a fair, fair way to put it. So the, oh, actually, I'm just going to quickly demonstrate. So the initial song is very much in a, um, it's got a sort of schmaltzy, Gershwin-esque feel to it. And this song you just heard actually also started that way. I didn't intend to change it. It started as a, um, some, oh, I say schmaltzy. It's slightly more modern musical theater, but it was meant to be a, And then I realized that that was absolutely terrible. And so I started with this. Uh, probably far too late into the writing process. Um, and I, well, I think anyway, it has a much punchier feel to it. And I think it just seems in a way more authentic with the way that the characters are actually communicating. Um, Leo, I don't know if you can, if you want to elaborate on that slightly in terms of the relationship well, between style. I think I think for me, one of the fun things about this stage of the process is we last year were lucky enough to do essentially a mini tour of the work in focus version of this show through uh, Leeds, York and London. Uh, I think Lisa Peschel uh, is actually here and she was kind enough to be of great help in sorting out our York leg of the tour. So thank you, Lisa, uh, as ever. Uh, Lisa also gave me my first job as an assistant, as a director any, on anything that wasn't a university show. So I am eternally in Lisa's debt. Um, so with this musical development, I wrote the lyrics for the later songs thinking they were going towards a sort of gershwin -y direction. And then Jake came back to me with this very different sound world and then working out how do you rewrite the text because the adaptation process of this has always been a slightly odd shift of Michael has ideas which are very much rooted in an academic framework and what do these things tell us about the wider history of the world and for me that's always something I'm trying to do in music because I think it's something music can do extremely well. Music is all about the relationship between different instruments, between different vocalists, so you can use it to demonstrate social forces as well as individuals. So then working on these songs, as Jake said, it suddenly became very apparent that rather than trying to do a sort of Gershwin pastiche where it said, these issues are not part of the modern world by updating the musical and lyrical style to something a little more uh, popular, pop, contemporary pop music uh, allowed us to say, no, these, these questions about what are you trying to record in your history are still very pertinent. Uh, it is still very much a question of if you are saying history is about individual heroes, then you are excluding the work of huge masses of people which have constructed the modern world we live in. Uh, and particularly with Kenneth Meese being of a more socialistic uh, political framework and the more your sort of British European sense of socialism, not the contemporary American political one. Uh, that gave a really useful voice in the song, Our Living Archive, to go, 
this isn't just we should be nice to people this is specifically the masses that shape history shouldn't be neglected and as i imagine everyone has seen in the news arguments about who should we be commemorating are still fairly hot topics jake over to you with the hot yeah. potato no you um you sort of started to touch upon there as well the there's a sort of tension when you're working with um a, a piece of history and a piece of academia as well in that um, all of the facts that are interesting historically are not always useful in illustrating uh, the, the drama of the piece. And I think for writing the songs, a very difficult question was, okay, what exactly is this song going to be about? Because there are, you know, there is a near infinite supply of historical an anecdotes about these uh, characters that's incredibly interesting. But what is the song about? And I think uh, to put it into a sentence with the song that we just had, it was really, um, I don't know, Leah, what would you say? Is it what everyone or everyone deserves to be remembered or? I think it's, for me at least, it was an interesting tension between when you hear Leopold Kodowski Jr. talk and write about the purpose of the Living Archive, or indeed the people he thinks have been neglected by history, he focuses on individuals. Whereas the sort of intellectual movements Kenneth Meese is involved in, they emphasize that, yes, you should remember everyone, but that's because you should remember these trends and mass movements. Um, broadly speaking, I hugely oversimplify, and one of the ongoing delights of this musical is that it's a musical, and generally speaking, musicals are not quite as useful as academic texts for very detailed and sophisticated representations of actual facts. Um, so if you want facts, listen to Michael. If you want nice tunes, listen to Jake. If you want text that hugely oversimplifies very complicated historical debates. That's my job. Uh, fantastic. And I think with the first number as well, it, it kind of, it touches upon many things, but again, it really boils down to what if what happened to us, i.e. the Jews, what if what happened to us happens to everyone. And so I, at, at the heart of all these, you know, quite complex dialogues, it's all, it, I think to turn it into a song, it always has to be to some extent, I don't know if simplified is the right word, boiled down, I think. Hmm. But uh, because I'm aware we have a schedule and people probably have other things they want to do tonight. Uh, no. We've had the enormous pleasure of working with the Lithuanian Embassy, who also put on a wonderful event called Litvak Days, uh, which delves into academia. And it's another really great example of how you can integrate academia and creative output. So it uh, seems like a good moment to pop into the chat a link to another video. And this one is a sort of condensed version of a very exciting, uh, well, in program events, but we'll talk more later. Here's a link. Watch YouTube. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth Litvak Days. where we really can witness uh, extremely valuable uh, legacy of uh, Jewish culture, which is important not only for Litvaks, not only for Lithuania, but around the globe. Today we are symbolically starting our Litvak days with an opening concert dedicated both to one of the most distinguished Lithuanian Jewish contemporary music composers, Anatolius Shenderovas, who left sadly our world a year ago. Intensive developments in the field of memory culture of Jewish heritage and the Holocaust have already taken place in Lithuania, especially during the past decade. I don't think Lithuania can understand its own history without understanding the place of Jews within that history. And I've got to say, this is something that is really quite, um, really quite special for us. And we wouldn't have these kinds of events without them. And I think we've had a really good, honest, constructive engagement going on for a long time. And I can only hope that it continues. So hopefully by now, everyone's had a chance to see a very condensed version of Lit Fact Days. But uh, Yusti, would you like to tell us more? Uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you uh, and everyone, the beautiful 
a wonderful creative team that has made this event possible. So Leo Dalton, Jack Dorf Dorfman and Professor Michael Berkowitz. And of course, we are really a uh, Lithuanian embassy in the UK and uh, Lithuanian culture ministry is really grateful for partnership. That's a long going partnership with the UCL. And uh, I think for us, it's really crucial to kind of keep working together. And it really helps me and my colleagues and all the Lithuanian audience and worldwide audience to unearth these stories that you just told, uh, which are the stories from the past, but in this creative way presented, uh, synthesized and critically reflected back through these new creative ideas uh, like we just saw. Uh, what they, this year we had Litvak Days, which are yearly Litvak Days that we organize in London together with the embassy colleagues and external partners. We had three events. Uh, you can watch all of them. They're all recorded. They were first time we did it virtually. So we organized three events. Uh, one is a, uh, was the opening concert with the uh, very renowned musicians, Rafael Skarpis, Dale de Dinskait, and many others. So please go on the YouTube of the Lithuanian Embassy in the UK channel, and you will find all these recordings in full. And then we had also two discussions. One, is, uh, one was about embracing Jewish legacy. Have Lithuania, has Lithuania reached a milestone where Professor Michael Berkowitz was also participating? It covered many topics, including the great synagogue in, the, in Vilnius. And um, also there was another discussion on contemporary art as a vehicle to speak about the past. And it also invited uh, contemporary artists such as Jen Janie Kagan, Esther Shalav Gertz and other speakers. Uh, so yes, this triad of events formed these, this year's virtual Litvak days, uh, which were basically dedicated mostly to the fact that Lithuania this year celebrates the year of the Vilna Gaon, who brought the uh, fame to Vilnius of uh, the, the name of the North Jerusalem. And so it's 300 years since the birth of the Vilna Gaon. And also this year is dedicated to uh, uh, Jewish history and culture in Lithuania. So we have international conferences um, happening in Poland, in, in Lithuania and other places. So um, please, uh, uh, it's, if you have an opportunity to find them and follow our Twitter, we will make sure there are more events advertised. What is interesting about Kolnas, which is not Vilnius, not a place of gone birth, but Konas 2022, in 2022 will be the cultural capital of Lithuania, of, sorry, Europe. <laughs> and they are actually very much invested in presenting a lot of stories, unearthing the past and bringing and collaborating with uh, famous Jewish uh, names or um, making events. For example, uh, they, they have made a special concert uh, for, uh, which is dedicated to the ghetto orchestra. Then in 2022, I'm sure they're going to continue their uh, famous format of the city telling festival. Uh, there will be this year, they will uh, present a new street artwork dedicated to Leah Goldberg and other famous uh, Jewish inhabitants. So actually, Konas 2022 is really actively already putting out a lot of projects and preparing new ones. There are some actually quite big names as well. I don't want to maybe uh, promise too much now, but I'm sure you're gonna hear about them and uh, please uh, really follow them. They have a great, great program coming up. And I'm hope that uh, Michael or Lee or Jack will also have an opportunity to visit and join us in celebrating that. So thank you everyone who joined us here and I'm curious to, to hear more of the Q&A uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, so we now have some questions in chat and also in case you'd like to see more of Litvak Days, which I would recommend it's a really interesting series of talks. You can find the videos at the link I've just popped into the chat down there. Uh, so, 
Michael, first question in the chat is one for you. Uh, <laughs> listening to the song about the Living Archive reminds me of the work of German photographer August Sander. Michael, did Manitin Kodowski know Sander's work? Is there any relationship? That's from Beth Schneider. Um, actually, nothing that I've seen. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a great question. And um, Sander is now recognized as an incredibly important figure. But one of the things that I found in my own work is there were a lot of photographers who were um, doing similar work to him. And actually, even in the Jewish world in very out of the way, very out of the way places, although he was uh, a quite extraordinary. But in terms of photographs of people as workers in their working lives, in particular, this is um, something that was actually um, um, quite common. But it's interesting to know sort of who's known and who isn't known at the time. And I'd say the photographer they were probably the most aware of and interested in who towered above everyone else was Alfred Stieglitz. That is, uh, there really wasn't anyone close um, for the people of, um, for Manus and Godowski's generation. Thank you. And as I've said before, if anyone wants to put questions in the chat, feel free. If not, I'm going to throw a question over to Jake because it's one of the questions writers always want to ask composers. And that is... I'm sorry, I'm, just before you do that, I suppose it's probably worth saying that um, because there was quite a tight deadline with this, we kind of both did our work and there wasn't as much time to communicate about it. So I think Leo first heard some of these songs, you know, what, a week ago or something like that. So. Yeah. Uh, so there are many questions for us to have between ourselves anyway. So yeah, Oh, no, it wasn't an accusatory question. In fact, it was because of this slightly weird pandemic process. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never met any of these musicians or singers. I've never even actually had the chance to speak to them directly because one of the way the knowledge exchange works, it's a very condensed way of working towards the end of the academic year. Mm -hmm. uh, so one question I had for you was, to what extent when you were working with the musicians, were you trying to convey to them sort of the body of academic research and how far were you trying to just give them a score to see how they interpreted it as a work in its own right? Mm. Um, so I, I would have a very different answer when it comes to the singers and the musicians generally. Um, I think when it comes to musicians, not including the music director, when it comes to the you know, person on the violin and the bass and so on, there's a great analogy that was always used at music school, which was the Siberian performance. If your score had to be given to an ensemble in Siberia with no telephone and no email and so on, and there's a concert and you have absolutely no hand in it, would you be happy with the performance? Or would you be comfortable knowing how it's going to be performed from the score you've given them? And if not, then the answer is you haven't put enough detail into your score. And so I think as, as an arranger and orchestrator, it is actually my job to make sure that people don't really need that much context because they know exactly what they have to play. And that should, in the arrangement and the orchestration itself, have everything that it needs for the music to hit powerfully. Of course, that often doesn't work. When it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the actors and also I think for the music director who's overseeing it, it's very different. So I gave them all a very condensed, not, not quite, a, a, a very condensed background, not quite the full speech that Michael gave us, but um, a, a, a background to the lives of Manes and Gadowski and Mies and how, and their work with Kodachrome and with Mies' involvement in, with Jewish refugees and so on. Because for them, of course, it's very, very important that they have a, as clear a picture of the characters and their story as possible. And, so I, I, I think, does that answer the question? So for, for the person playing the violin or the triangle, usually not very much. That seems, uh, ah, hold on. How do we have? Julian is asking a question. Um, no, I think while, while Julian's typing, I think one thing that for me is really interesting in the sort of Chinese whispers of Michael to us, to the artists, is is the translation of what information do you need to know to actually do your job mm. um and also then particularly when you get to the stage of the singers talking to their friends about it it, it sort of ends up in this weird loop of michael has loads of wonderful anecdotes that are fascinating to us and then we work out how do we make it into a work with some sort of coherent sense of drama then we pass it on to the singers who mostly want to know how do i build a character and then the singers sort of go back to the stories 
but they're the stories we've kind of reinvented to make them work as a musical. Uh, Susie, yes, we are recording this, and uh, I've also received a private question uh, in secret. So what is the role of color in this actually? Let's start with Julian's question. Uh, Again, or? Um... Sorry, Joe's question, my apologies. Okay. Uh, Michael, I suspect that's mainly for you. Okay. Um, um, well, uh, 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 what we can say about color is that color drives everything because um, the main motivation for, um, for Manis and Gadowski in developing color film was that they could not believe that photography was as limited as it was in, uh, you know, in the early 20th century. That is, compared to sound, where it seemed possible to more or less reproduce the full spectrum of sound, they couldn't believe that only a small fraction of what people saw in terms of color that is between black and white and grays and various tones could be reproduced. And they couldn't believe that it was impossible to do it. So this is what really drove them. And of course, the main thing they were thinking about was movies, you know, was, um, was creating color movies. And in terms of their own experiments, this is really what they did. There were color processes at the time, but they were expensive, they were inconsistent. Again, some of them are really, are really quite extraordinary. And they took these things apart and they put them back together and they uh, put things you know, in combinations as it never existed before. They did some things that were, that were completely different, but what drove the whole thing was color. And then eventually what they tried to do was to combine movies and sound as well and integrate them in a, integrate them in a, um, in a better way. But um, in terms of chemicals and phys uh, chemistry and physics, what they were doing was trying to connect it to real life color um, as much as possible. So that's really, um, that's really a wonderful question. I would say just along these lines that I am planning, um, that is if we're, if we're a, hopefully we'll be able to go ahead with all these things um, I am planning on curating an exhibition in Lithuania um, in the town where, um, where Leopold Godowski was born, um, which is sort of between Kaunas and, um, and Vilnius. Actually, the building happens to be a, um, a former synagogue, which is now a community center. But I showed, um, I showed the plaque, which is really quite a beautiful plaque, which has a piano keyboard and very nice image of Godowski. So hopefully that will be a modest exhibition but the exhibition is going to be on the connections between color photography and music, because I think there's no way to understand the development of color photography without looking at music and particularly the, the kind of legacy that, um, that Leo Godowski Sr. has. Thank you. And then I think that actually leaves me in a really good place uh, to answer the final question I've got here. Um, we may not have, oh, how does Michael feel about, the complexity uh, of his work being simplified in the libretto. We do have long conversations about it because it is, <laughs> it's the central tension of it. I think we don't, I don't think we've ever had a full blown argument because we both understand where the other one's coming from. My undergraduate degree was in history and it really bothers me when I don't present it correctly. Uh, it's mostly about what gets left out because obviously in a 400 page academic book, you can include more information than in a 90 minute musical where they take the time to sing really slowly sometimes. Uh, but in terms of the overall vision for the piece, which is a final question, I think it's a lot of what Michael was saying about colour. The central idea for the piece is how can you create a more full colour vision of history without losing it? And that sort of plays out both across, well, which version of the Godowski story do we tell? They have bits of their lives that Dagmar has this gloriously scandalous bio autobiography she writes, uh, which includes various bits of stuff that Leopold Kodowski Jr. doesn't necessarily mention. And how do you combine these different sources into an overall vision of the past? And then also, of course, in the form of musical theater, how do you make a musical that does also show the past in an interesting way? But we're coming on to six o'clock. So hopefully everyone's had a lovely evening and to uh, takes out on a slightly melancholic note, I'm going to send you the song, I Do What I Can, in which Kenneth Meese talks about his efforts to try and save at least some of the Jewish scientists being persecuted by the Nazis.
and have a lovely evening everyone thank you everyone all the musicians academics and so on who've worked on this uh, see you soon come and press reports and I receive new letters every week that say oblique discreet and screaming between the lines help me please don't make me have to stay I do what I can but I can't do enough sometimes the truth is the going is right But there's always a cry Their friend or their child or their lover But I justify and testify That we require a new researcher Make their bench, they work, they toil Then suddenly they'll suggest Help him ease, he's smart, my friend, that man I do what I can, but I can't do enough. Somebody make them see through all my guff. I help 25, but they need 20 score. Don't hope I can help get one more through the door. But I disappoint myself and my poor friends. Losing hope for those they've left We laugh, we sing, ignore what we all know I do what I can, but I can't do enough Some were saved, but others were not I helped who I could, and others passed by Failed me, forgive me, but I And that is our show. Thank you everyone for coming. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.